This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. After a year and a half toiling through life as an actor in Los Angeles, Shannon O'Donnell left in 2008 on an 11-month around-the-world adventure. She had hopes that traveling and volunteering would act as a reset button on her life. Many times she traveled with family and friends, including six months traveling and homeschooling her 11-year-old niece, Anna. Along the way, the experiences shaped and changed who she is and how she travels. And five years later, Shannon is still traveling and writing. You can learn more about Shannon's adventures at alittleadrift.com. Shannon O'Donnell, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thanks so much for having me. Shannon, I want to talk about your background. Tell me a little bit about what was it like working as an actor in Los Angeles? Well, I would be lying if I didn't say it was one of the more difficult decisions I had decided to do after college. I graduated with a degree in marketing, but I had also studied acting, obviously. (laughs) Maybe not obviously. I decided, you know, to not do the acting side or the um, advertising side of my studies and instead move to LA, do the big move and go out there. And it was harder, infinitely harder to move to a city where I literally knew absolutely nobody. And I had never visited LA before. I got in my car, drove across the country and said, well, I hope I can make some friends. And after, you know, a year and a half, I decided that it wasn't really jiving with me. It wasn't a path that was making me happy. I was miserable. So I decided to travel. What? So tell me a little bit about this acting part of it though. That's what has me intrigued. (laughs) I mean, were you doing like commercial acting or were you in plays or were you in movies or, I mean, tell me about, about that. Oh, I said, you want the nitty gritties. Okay. I, I had a commercial agent, so I went on a lot of commercial auditions and I, I did some much smaller local work. No theater in LA. I never did any of the theater there. And I did background work a lot as I tried to, you know, maintain flexibility to go on auditions. So it was background work for TV and film. I can see myself in a but a, a few high profile movies like back there in the background, which is not acting at all. But it was a way to help pay the bills while I just went on a lot of auditions. And so, you know, people sort of say that you have to be out there for you have to commit to 10 years to really give yourself the opportunity to get the agents and get used to the city and make the connections because it really is who you know. So I gave up after a year and a half. I was like, get me out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So what was it that sparked your desire to do this travel? Well, the year long trip was not the initial idea. So my best friend left LA. She actually had enough of it as well. Um, My friend that I had met, we became best friends. And then she left before I did. She went to India for three months. And she came back with stories and I went, wow, maybe I could go to Japan. And I planned to go to Japan and hike Mount Fuji, which I've never done in the five years. This was the original plan. I started hiking and I started preparing for this hike. And after I started looking at flights to Japan and reading up on bloggers who talked about going there, and this was the very early days of travel blogging. So there are very few sites out there. I sort of hatched the plan. I found a few people who were traveling for a year. And I went, wait a minute, nobody told me I could do that. (laughs) So I did. So I decided that that was going to be it. I said, well, why leave for, you know, a month in Japan, if I can use Japan as a launching point, which ended up being Australia instead of Japan, I moved to Australia. And I started as Australia as my launching point for the year long trip. It's interesting that you mention in the early days, because in my, my notes here, I have, uh, ask you about meet plan go so this probably would even predated that yes they didn't exist the main travel website that i used to plan was boots and all and so they had a huge round the world traveler forum people told me my initial plan to visit some 25 countries like the the seasoned travelers in the forums there were like you're insane cut that down to like 15 max I took their advice. I did. I I cut out all of South America and plans to go to Africa. And instead I just did Asia, Eastern Europe and, you know, sort of things in that region. What was the deciding factor to, or was there any one deciding factor to choose the countries that you did? Well, I had a few commitments. So I'll be honest, the reason I chose Australia was 
because I was living in LA and it was the cheapest one-way flight I could find that got me really far away from the United States so that I would have to work my way back. So I found a one-way ticket to Sydney and I booked it the same day I found it. And then I actually had a panic attack. I called my best friend and I was like, this is the worst idea ever. I just bought a ticket. Should I cancel it? And of course her answer was no, no, don't do it. <laughs> so I had five months at that point. I had bought the ticket for five months and my plan was to work my way back to the US. And then a few friends, one, my cousin, she says, well, I'll meet you in India. And I said, okay, well, I have four months to get to India. And then three months after that, I had to be in Italy to meet up with another one of my friends. And so I sort of hopscotched my way around with the commitments of people who had agreed to meet me. What were some of the fears that you had going through your head before you, you set out or maybe even before you booked the ticket? Oh, there were many. I'm going to sound really neurotic if I list them all out. Uh, I was terrified of being alone. You know, you don't understand the hostel culture until you've been in it, you know, and you go downstairs and people are like, hey, join us on a day trip or join us on some beers out on the town. But when I'm sitting there looking at my backpack with, you know, 40 pounds worth of stuff, I'm like, this is it. This is these th these clothes are going to be my friends. What if no one wants, you know, what if I don't have any friends? What if no one wants to talk to me? What if I just can't do it? And so I worked myself up into a good a good, you know, panic attack in the days before I left worrying about how I was going to make it work. Let's talk a little about your travels. Um, what country or maybe what region provided the most, uh, the best memories for you? Well, Southeast Asia has always called to me. So I've gone back there a few times. It's where I traveled with my niece. I felt really confident. I, it was year three when I started traveling with her and it just felt safe. And the culture is very welcoming. The food is fantastic. There's a, a decent enough tourism infrastructure where I really loved it when I was there the first time. And then I went back and I lived in Thailand because Again, it was just, it felt really comfortable and still new and still everything that travel is supposed to be, but not hard. And so when I was like, where can I take my niece, who's 11 and had never, you know, I bought, I got her her passport to travel with me. She had never been outside the U.S. I went, well, I want somewhere as warm and welcoming for her. And so we went back to Asia. So talk to me a little about the travel with your niece. I'm guessing at this point, you're not a parent, so you don't have that type of an experience and uh, this idea has dropped upon you. What, what are you thinking? It was alarming at first. I had always wanted to travel with my niece. She and I are very close and I was a nanny in college. It's, and I was a nanny in LA actually as well. I had a family out there that I worked for, uh, several times a week. And so I love kids. I can do kids there. You know, I don't have any kids as you said, but, but I do really understand it. I'm a kid person. So when it was first dropped upon me, I was like, well, you know, I could probably do this. Not so hard, right? You know, and then I actually, re the reality of traveling with her and homeschooling her was incredibly difficult. There was a, an adjustment period where we both had some, you know, she, she was pulled out of school for it. So we both had things that we had to learn that first month on the road, how to travel together, how to make the education thing work as a part of my past travels I had only done alone. And yeah, but all in all, after, you know, six months, we'd gotten the hang of it, and she was a fantastic companion. Kids are amazed at everything. It's really easy to impress a child. <laughs> what were some of the bigger challenges, and how did you deal with those? Um, parenting. I mean, this would, this would go less into travel and more into adjusting to 24 hours a day. And even more than at home, you know, when you're on the road, homeschooling. Versus, you know, when they go to a school, you just, you have them with you, talking to you, wanting to be entertained or, you know, talking to you about the education and things that we're learning and just constantly on all the time. And as a solo traveler, that wasn't something that I was like, used to. Even when I was a nanny, you know, you give them back. And so we, we talked it out. You know, I told her that sometimes I needed some evenings. I needed her to go to bed early and get a good night's sleep so that I could read a book without her in the room <laughs> and things like that. You know, she respected my space a lot. She was 11, so it was easier than, say, a toddler. So some of the things you you did, for example, was you let her plan plan the day, for example. And also, yes. <clears throat> also you you guys got into doing some volunteer work. Um, 
one of the things you mentioned was the We Women Foundation. Uh, can you talk a little about that? Absolutely. I I have always volunteered. It's a sort of cornerstone of my travels. I don't specifically plan normally ahead. I like to find projects that resonate when I'm in a region. And so with Anna, we based ourselves out of Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I knew that we were going to have at least four months that we were in Chiang Mai. And she was interested in the idea of giving back, of learning more about the mission behind the We Women Foundation, which they educate Burmese refugees. And traditionally, a child wouldn't be able to help with them because they help the Burmese refugees with their university level English. And so Anna wasn't quite a good fit. But the woman had a special case right after I asked if they had any openings for someone with a, a child. They said, actually, we have this amazing opportunity, our housekeeper. She doesn't qualify for our program, but she's been you know, working with us for a couple of years at this point. Would you guys be willing to teach her? And we did. And we went a few times a week and Anna picked out the lesson plans and, and we decided how we were going to communicate. And she really got into it. So it was really wonderful to see that there was that connection. And, and she understands a lot about Burma because when we had that connection to Burma and the struggles of the people, she was much more willing to learn about the history of the country and why those struggle, struggles existed. Shannon, tell me a little bit more about what it's like to travel in Burma. That was a highlight of my travels with my niece. So we had already been on the road. We'd been in Thailand for three months at that point, November, December, and then we left in January. And there was no internet. This was when Burma was first opening. So internet was super scarce. I think I checked it twice in the three and a half weeks we were there. And she and I got to hang out. You know, we, we did our schoolwork ahead of time. And the people were incredible. So it was like my niece and I were in our travel groove. And then we would go to the, we went to this country that was just starting to wake up from, you know, to international tourism as more and more people came and everyone was overwhelmingly friendly. I know that that's what everyone says about Thailand. And, and then you go to Laos and you're like, wow, they're so friendly in every place I've found that. But in Myanmar, I think because it was still such a rare site because not the masses hadn't come yet. People were very surprised. And, and I remember this one time we were in Mandalay, I think it was maybe five o'clock in the morning. Someone was on, two people were on a motorbike and we were in the back of a truck on our way to the airport or the bus station actually. And my niece and I are back there. And these these two bike riders, they were just thrilled that they had spotted us in the back of the car. And so they paced us and they didn't know very much English. In fact, they didn't know any English. And they all they knew was um, mother. And they kept pointing at me asking if I was her mother. And I knew the word, the Burmese word, I had already learned it for niece. And I told them that she was my niece. And they just, they just were giving us high fives and smiling. And again, they paced us the entire way to the bus station, just trying to communicate that they were glad that we were here sightseeing and seeing their country and experiencing it, um, which doesn't need language, right? Like we got the welcome. They were just very welcoming. How's the tourist infrastructure there? Uh, was it easy to find hostels and places to stay? There are guest houses. Absolutely. And when we were there, which was a year and a half ago, so it was in 2012, January of 2012, there was, there was a shortage. And I believe that it's starting to change. They have their first ATM got put in last year and, and things like that are helping the tourist infrastructure, but there is more tourism than there are guest houses. So you sometimes have to call a day or two in advance. And that's more on the budget side. There's enough accommodation, but if you want to stay budget, it's not cheap like Thailand. You know, guest houses run $25, $30 a night, whereas in Thailand, you can get it for six or nine. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And the there are buses to get you everywhere. They're just, they're not the nice buses like they are in Thailand. They're much older buses. They freeze you out though, just like in Thailand. You gotta bring a wool coat, a parka to, uh, to survive the bus rides. One of the things that I know that you're into from reading through your blog is coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me about this, this man named Lee and the, if I'm saying it right, the Aka Ama coffee. Yeah, it's actually Aka Ama. And so Aka people are an indigenous hill tribe culture. They are throughout sort of northern Burma, Laos, Thailand, and and even Vietnam. And so Lee is the face of the Aka Ama Coffee Company. And they run a social enterprise, which was sort of my first, Lee was my first introduction really to how not only the concept of social enterprise works, but also 
the effect that it has. And so I already loved coffee and I was willing to go anywhere. You know, Lee is a charmer. And so when he started talking about how the coffee that he roasts and sells goes back to support, you know, his family who lives two and a half hours away up a mountainside nearby in Chiang Rai, and that this collective want to take their com- their coffee directly to market so that they can support their community without a middleman. And he really went into the history and I went, this is excellent. Not only is it fantastic coffee and it was <laughs> but um you know it was this social mission behind it that really made me want to become friends with lee and learn more about his business model and everything that he's doing there what country would you say shannon provided the most challenges for you oh that's a tough question it's always when I'm either sick or the food. So as a vegetarian, I would say Bosnia. I really enjoyed Bosnia, but it was tough as a vegetarian to travel there because it's a very meat-based culture. And so I was hungry a lot. I ate a lot of apples from the grocery store. Uh, and then Belize. I got incredibly sick in Belize, and I couldn't figure out why. Um, so I just left. And unfortunately, that probably says nothing about Belize, but it really – was not excellent. I I had really poor health care there. They couldn't figure out what was wrong and gave me sort of the wrong shots. And it was just bad. And so I don't normally share it with people because it's not Belize's fault. You know, other people love the country, but not excellent. Overall, throughout your travels, how how have you held up health wise? Oh, I I have a long list of ailments. You know, that's that's something a lot of people fear, right, is the getting sick on the road. And it was certainly something you know, my mom was like, ah, don't die in the middle of a country. We can't ever find you again. I said, okay, mom, I'll try. And yeah, I've gotten really sick. I almost died of dysentery in Laos. And then I got Giardia in Laos a few years later, actually with Anna. And I had a lot of traveler bugs, but I carry Cipro. And, you know, as travelers know you at the pharmacies internationally, you can get almost anything you need right over the counter. You can just walk in and ask for an antibiotic and they'll give it to you. So it's really easy to keep it stocked in case you get sick and need to self-administer. Let's go back and talk about volunteering a little more because uh, I want to get into the, the book. What mistakes did you make when you were early on in your volunteering? Well, I, I didn't research enough. I went with good intentions and in the industry, in the volunteerism industry now, they say, you know, good intentions aren't good enough. And there's some truth in that because I didn't understand the what questions I needed to be asking about where my money was going and how it was impacting the community and sort of the relationship between the middleman. I paid someone to organize a volunteer experience for me in Nepal and it didn't work out very well. My monastery that I volunteered at didn't get any of my volunteer fee and they were feeding me and, you know, Every day they gave me a a room to use when I was on the monastery campus. And so there were all these things where I sort of went, I felt like even though I was offering the monastery volunteer service, I had paid money to cover my stay and it wasn't covering any of my stay at the monastery. It was going toward, you know, what the organization had a deal at a local hotel and things like that. And so it just, it was things that I wished I had knew to ask sooner. Shannon, what are you trying to teach people about volunteering? It's all the questions that I wish that I knew the framework behind. So when people say ask about the relationship your company has with the local community, how long are they working within that community? Well, you can ask that. But if you get the answer, do you know what you're looking for? What is the ethical quandary there? Why do you have to ask that question? And is the work that you're about to be doing beneficial to the community or is it better if you donate and they hire a local like these are all questions that even just asking you send an email and ask this question you really need to understand the ethics behind it so that you can make your own judgment and so in the volunteer travelers handbook what I really try to do is lay out the framework of the industry and I present problems with sort of both sides like here's the issue I'm not going to tell you where you have to sit on the ethical like you know continuum, but I'm going to present it to you so that when you are in these communities, you can really have the framework to make accurate judgments, not, you know, accurate is hard because that's, that's the wrong word to use, but to make 
reasoned judgments about your actual effect on these communities because volunteering is really a part of development work. You're a, you're part of development in the aid industry. And when you don't link them together, there's the potential for harm. And so my book tries to sort of link volunteerism and aid and give you the our review effect. So if you're looking for actual volunteer projects, I then suggest how you can do research, but it's more of the framework for understanding the industry. One of the things I know you want to do from reading through your website is you want to do more speaking and you want to get people engaged in, in travel and the opportunity to volunteer and especially young people. And um, you've had some chances to speak at some um, conferences and so on. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of those um, speaking engagements. Absolutely. I'm actually just recently I was at Shenandoah University in Virginia. And I spoke at international convocation for them with some students who were about to, for many of them, for 50 students, they were about to go this spring break coming up and they're going to go for the first time out of the country. And before they found out where they were going, it's sort of like a lottery, Price is Right style, come on down. So after they find out that they're going, they find out where they're going. And it's through the university, so it's a big surprise. I got to talk with these students before they found out where they were going and sort of preface for them and one of the one of the cornerstones of my talk was global citizenship was this idea of travel being the extender and this is what i want i hope that students understand is that once you go over there it's more than taking the picture in front of the taj mahal which is cool and awesome and i have a jumping shot in front of the taj but it's when you go over and you sort of ask the questions and you talk to the people and you really try, try to see and you stay long enough to see through the eyes of the locals what's going on that you you start to feel a part of this shared humanity. And that's what I think is magical, that the sooner you get somebody over there, the wider their job prospects are, their their view on life and their potential to connect with everyone globally is. That's what I believe travel can be. Absolutely. You've also been named one of the National Geographic Travelers of the Year. Congratulations. I think that is so cool. Oh, thank you so much. I did a happy dance when I found out. How does that come about? Tell me about that. Well, they take nominations. And this past year, 2013, they got 1,500 people. And they narrowed it down to 10. And there were 16 of us, but some people are couples. So they got joint awards. And it's for people who are traveling with passion and purpose. Those are the two things that you have to fulfill in some some manner. And so all of us had really different projects that we were working on. And they honored me for grassroots volunteering, which is a database of independent volunteer opportunities and social enterprises like Lee that I had talked about, like the coffee, Akaama Coffee Farm. And so that's a social enterprise. And I have a a website alongside the book. And National Geographic thought that that was really helping purposeful travel, helping support the idea of purposeful travel. Very cool. How do you find out? Do you get a phone call? Do you get an email? I got an email. (laughs) I did. Shannon, what's one new thing about the world you think you've learned since you've been on your travels? How small and interconnected we all are. So I landed in Bangkok two months into my round the world trip. I stayed in Australia for two months. And then my first stop in the developing world was Bangkok. And I was overwhelmed. Culture shock does not even begin to describe my first night in that huge city. And within two days, my my computer had broken. Things just were going wrong. I was not sure I could handle this travel thing once again. We were talking about fears. That was it. I was like, ah, this is is everything I feared happening. And I'm in a hotel and a college friend who also was an actress in L.A. So we had gone to college in Florida together. And I met her randomly at a party. Again, I saw her in Los Angeles when we were both out there. And I ran into her, bodily ran into her at a hotel in Thailand. And we decided to travel for six weeks together. And so that's sort of like a small world connection from my past. And it extends to everything. It's it's sort of random, you know, hotel owner in China knew a friend that I had met in Myanmar, you know, a traveler who had passed through and we managed to connect the dots that that had happened. And just, we're all so interconnected and we have the same needs and wants and desires in life. And it's just, I feel like the planet is, is so much more huggable. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but you know, like it's, it's, I can, I can grasp it. It's all there. You can easily connect these cultural dots if you want to. Have you learned anything new about yourself? 
I have for sure. I think I know travel made me face sort of the worst aspects of myself. I just get really angry, you know, quick to anger. It's the Irish in me, I guess. But I had to, you know, learn to face myself, you know, in these situations where you're really frustrated and the train's late and, and all these things go wrong and look at yourself and say, who are you in that moment? I look at myself and I say, this isn't the person I want to be. It's a really good thing. I have a 48 hour bus ride coming up to think about this. <laughs> and then I would think about it, you know, and like come up with, with the person I've wanted to be based on just a lot of time. You know, a lot of us work nine to five and we, and we, have busy weekends. And if you go that lifestyle, you don't have time to sort of work on those personal aspects of yourself. So I feel like I've healed parts of myself that were less than awesome to be around in my early twenties. If you were to run across somebody who's on the fence about doing a year off, like you were years ago, what would you tell them? Mm -hmm. Buy the plane ticket. That's always my first advice. I say buy the plane ticket now. Commit yourself to it because when you give yourself a time limit, you'll meet it. You know, you'll figure out the way. We are amazingly creative humans are. So if you give yourself 10 months, you'll fill those 10 months with tasks to prepare yourself for travel. If you give yourself five months, you'll fill those five months and you'll still get on the airplane and you can buy things you forget there and you can learn, you know, you're never going to feel ready. I stepped on the airplane terrified of landing in Sydney all by myself. And it wouldn't have mattered if I had given myself another year. I still would have been terrified. So it was sort of committing to your dream, giving yourself that timeline of firm commitment, and then going through the fear and the panic and the planning and the, you know, getting rid of your belongings and all of that, but having the framework of a timeline to do it. Are you a gear person? Are you really into your gear? I love the gear I have. You know, I don't like test out a lot, but I do love my gear. <laughs> Tell me about your backpack. I have an Eagle Creek and it's 65. So I'm actually going to downgrade to 40 and I've picked it out online. Also Eagle Creek, which is my favorite gear company. They don't pay me to say that. Um, <laughs> but it was the first backpack that I had. My best friend had used it and she gave me it after her, her six months. And it was perfect. It had adjustable backpacking straps. You can cinch it down. And it, oh, my favorite part about it, and that's why I'll never buy some of these other companies, it's because it unzips completely. You know, it does the U instead of like a rucksack mm -hmm. that loads from the top. It has the U. Anyway, now now you're right. I did. I geeked out about my backpack, but that's what I love about it. So, okay. So, go back. Uh, what was the size of it? 65 liters. Oh, yeah. So, you had a 65. And so, you were thinking that was a little too large, and now you're going to downgrade to a 40 liter. Yes. Wow. That's good. Less is better, right? Yes. And, you know, just like timelines, your backpack, you, you will expand your belongings to fit it. I often leave with it, not, you know, three quarters full. And then I come back and I've just decided I really needed 10 tops instead of the six I left with. And ridiculous, ridiculous. What are you seeing other travelers out there with backpacks? Are they all like bringing giant backpacks or do more people lean towards the smaller size? I rarely see long-term travelers with huge backpacks. So you'll see people who are maybe 19 gap year student, 19 year old gap year students, and you can tell it's their first trip and they bought the 75, 80, 90 liter backpacks that are just enormous. They go above their heads even. And you know, they're sweating, walking up a hill toward a hostel. Um, <laughs> and I kind of feel sorry because anyone, I feel most people down, you know, they downsize as fast as they can if they stay on the road. Now, you spent some time in Shela, Guatemala, is that correct? I did, yes. Because I'm interested in the idea of going down to Latin America and doing a Spanish language school for a time. And so I'm curious, because I think you did that while you were in Shela. Can you tell me about what that was like? I loved going to Guatemala. Guatemala was one of my favorite countries. And Shela in particular is a town... There's definitely backpackers who go there, but it's not as touristy. So the Spanish language schools, you get real immersion. Many of the restaurants assume that you're there to learn. It's a very, very Spanish town. It's a very Guatemalan town. And so they assume that you're there if, if you're there, you're, that you're at a language school and you want to practice. So they don't default to English, even if they know it. Like, they'll really allow you to practice it. And so there's a bunch of language schools in Shayla, and many of them have volunteer projects associated with them even. So if you're interested in that, you can join on their service projects. Some are connected with schools. Mine 
was connected with like a rural stoves project where we built stoves in rural community on the weekends. And so it's a really great place, very affordable. It's one of the most affordable places to learn Spanish. I'm, I'm giving you thumbs up if you could see it. I love it. <laughs> what language school did you go to? It was called Pop Woo, and uh-huh. the Woo is spelled W-U-J. They were really kind to me as well. My, my debit card got copied, stolen, anyway, got canceled my very, like my second night there, first night there. I used an ATM that in the orientation they tell you not to use, but I didn't have orientation until two days later. So when I got there, I was like, I have no money to pay you. And the guy was so nice because I was really distraught. I had signed up for a week and I hadn't paid yet. And, you know, they waited till my debit card came in and they let me take classes. And so, you know, obviously that's an out there thing, but they were very kind to me. So how was your Spanish before you took the classes? My Spanish was decent. And so I was at a higher level. I can speak Spanish pretty well, but thing, you know, I'm not fluent and subjunctive and, you know, all of those sorts of past tenses can get really confused. So, it was great. We did. We would read the paper together in the morning and sort of discuss stories. My, I was one-on-one instruction. And so the woman and I would read the paper together. And then she would dissect everything and correct me in the afternoon. So we had like five hours, I think, working together. And the afternoon session was always her drilling the grammar points and the things I really didn't understand. But I felt like I progressed hugely in just the week I was there. Interesting. What was it like building these ovens? It was really neat because you go on a bus really far out you know outside of the city and then you hike up into a hill and it's the community they have a community fixer so a a local who works with papu to arrange who gets the next stove and the some of your volunteer fee goes toward just keeping the stove project going and what it is is you know when cook fires are inside the house many times small children get burnt or they have smoke inhalation issues and you know respiration problems for the rest of their life because of it so the stove project builds them a brick oven stove that they can use it's outside of their house it has its own ventilation so that when they're there they're not breathing in you know the smoke and the family is always nearby and they're required to sort of help they feed lunch and and they make sure they provide sort of a co-investment of effort so it's really a neat experience to see They took us to some stoves that had been built before so that we could see the family that was using it. And it was just, it was really cool. Very neat. Yeah. How, how many people are there volunteering with you? That day we were, we had one, we had two stoves at different stages. And so I think there were maybe eight of us, eight students who had decided to go. Did you ever have any issues finding internet access on your travels? I did. And I have worked the whole time that I've traveled. I have um, online clients that I do. I do online marketing for small businesses. And so from day one, i that's partly how I could afford to go in five months with such short notice was that I, I knew that I could sustain my work. But in India, there were towns that I passed through so quickly because I would show up and, and I actually, I was in a fairly large city. I think it was in Jaipur maybe. And they were terrified to let me hook up my own computer. And at the time I was using front page. And, you know, which is a program that is archaic and should never be used. But I was using Microsoft front page. And so I had to use my own laptop. And I convinced the guy to let me plug my the Ethernet cable into the side of my laptop because they didn't have Wi-Fi. And they were using computers from like 1992. And so he lets me do it. And he was like, I'm going to get in big trouble, you know, if my owner, if the owner comes in. And sure, sure enough, he did, because five minutes later, the owner came in. And I'm not sure what he thought was going to happen. But he was really horrified at the thought of my computer being hooked up. And so I had to leave the town and go to a new one because I just, I couldn't find internet that would let me hook up to it. How was the internet access situation in Shayla? Shayla, I had Wi-Fi at the hotel and I believe it was pretty strong too. So I was at a guest house. Can't remember the name, but they had weekly rentals. And so I just, I had a room for a week and I had Wi-Fi in the hotel and it was pretty good. And Pop Woo had computers that you could use as well. So you decided not to do a homestay. I did. And honestly, it was unfortunately because of my work, because I needed to have internet and they couldn't guarantee that with the homestay. I couldn't, at that point, I, I, I had clients. And so it was either not do the, the language school or do it from a hotel so that I could work at night. Shannon, you mentioned early on uh, loneliness as being a fear. What are some tips you've developed over the years to deal with that? 
Well, my first tip is always to, you know, call home. I call my dad. My dad has been super supportive. He raised me um, since I was eight. And so he's always been really supportive of my travels. And he does my mail, scans it in for me, keeps track of that. So it's been terrific. And hearing his voice, he'll always ground me. And that support is sometimes all you need. You know, it's like it's like when you're diving. I don't know if you do diving, but, you know, if you're in deep water, they tell you to hug yourself if you get scared underwater because you can't come to the surface if you're diving they tell you to just wrap your arms around and hug yourself because it's that assurance and so for me calling home is that it's sort of the hug i'm in the middle of a country where you know the language barrier is intense there might have been a cultural thing that you know threw me for a loop that day but calling home really grounds the experience watching some tv is the same thing so i might like download something onto my computer and watch a familiar tv show or something like that Do you ever run into people that just don't get what it is that you do? Naysayers, we can call them. And if you do, what do you say to them? I have surely run into people who they they get defensive, like maybe in choosing not to have the the traditional house and the nine to five and, and sort of talking about how I, I appreciate that I don't have a lot of belongings. I'm not saying that if you have a house and a big screen TV that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying in my life, you know, but they take offense to that. And so I just, I just sort of say, no, I, I get it. Not everybody is built to long-term travel. I have friends who really love the stayed family aspect and, and they're travelers. They go for two weeks at a time, but long-term in travel in particular is polarizing. And people will think that it's a statement that you are saying that the life choices they made are bad. And uh, in that regard, I always, sometimes I just stop talking about travel. And I say, no, you're right. And I started to try try to find a common ground with them. I'm saying, look, it's all cool. If you don't want to travel, it's okay. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to preach (laughs) unless I'm speaking. And then, and then I am supposed to be (laughs) telling you to travel. (laughs) How is the marathon training coming along? Oh goodness. I did 17 miles last week and it almost kicked my butt, but it felt really good. It's a, it's a psychological thing. No one tells you that. Maybe they tell you that. And I just haven't read those blogs. But once you get up there in the miles and you're going to be alone running for like four and a half hours, it's mental as much as anything, because I still had enough energy to keep running at 17. Not much, mind you. But it was more getting my shoes on and saying that I, I could do it, that I could spend the next four hours in motion for a reason you know, to get there, to get to the 26. When is the marathon? January 12th, I think it's at Disney World oh, Orlando. Wow, that's probably going to be a really big one. Thousands of people, right? Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure there's going to be a cast of Disney characters. My best friend loves Disney. She lives in Orlando and she's driving around the US, US actually with her husband. So that's why we haven't been training together, but we are going to run it together. Shannon, what's next for you? The tentative plan is. Africa. So I would love to go to Africa in mid-February. I have an event with National Geographic, actually, National Geographic Live, um, the first week of February. And so after that, I fly to Africa and go overland, potentially, for five months. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it's the big dream. I've never been to Africa yet. So, How can people contact you if they want to learn more about grassroots volunteering, about global citizenship, about a littleadrift.com? Well, they can, my email is on both of those websites, um, grassrootsvolunteering.org and a little drift.com. And then I'm on Twitter at Shannon RTW and Facebook. And, and I respond to every email. Sometimes it takes me a bit of time, but um, I will respond no matter what. Okay. Shannon O'Donnell, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you make it to Africa. Good luck over there and good luck in the marathon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on tonight. Recorded November 25, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. <laughs>